It's finally arrived. May 2nd and 3rd of this week on this campus, Summit 9, the annual conference of the Christian Alliance for Orphans will take place. Over 2,000 people from all over the world will connect, converse, and create ways to expand outreach to show God's love to orphans. And Brentwood has the privilege of hosting it. Here's what you can do. First, pray that God would do something extraordinary in the lives of Summit 9 participants so that more orphans hear, know, and receive God's love. And second, volunteer. It's not too late and your help would be appreciated. So sign up now and get more information at summit9.org forward slash volunteers. Hey students, just a reminder that summer is quickly approaching and with that comes our summer events. I want to encourage you to join us at Mission 615 which is our middle school missions week in the local Nashville area. Then high school can join us in Vancouver, British Columbia to help out at the Point Church with Pastor Victor Thomas or in Chicago, Reborn Community Church with Pastor Jamie Thompson. And I would like to invite every student to join us at Beach Camp in Panama City Beach, Florida the third week of June. And if you would like to invite a friend, bring them. You can register for all these events and find out more about our student ministry at brentwoodbaptist.com slash students. Hi, I'm Ray Fairchild, the Connection Minister here at Brentwood Baptist. I have the joy of contacting you if you feel God leading you to join our church, equipping you to share your faith with others, and along with our qualified decision counselors, helping you become members of our church. Welcome to worship. If you're a first-time guest, we would love for you to register your visit with us by completing a communication card. These cards are in the pew racks in front of you or in your bulletin if you're worshiping in Hudson Hall. And remember, anyone can use this card to update contact information or submit a prayer request so our prayer team can be praying for you. Just drop the card in the offering a little later in the service. Now, let's worship together. Well, good morning and welcome to worship. Would you stand? We're going to sing great songs this morning about salvation and what God has done.
suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. Thanks be to God for his word. You may be seated.
the word of God and the worship of God. That's what took place in that jail that evening with Paul and Silas. They were worshiping, singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening. And when the prison guard came to Paul and Silas and said, what must I do to be saved? They proclaimed the word of God, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and all of your household. That's why we gather in this room every week, the worship of God and the word of God. And that's what God calls us as followers of Christ to do with our lives outside these walls how we live our lives, how we worship Him in our daily walk, in our daily lives, in our relationships, and how we proclaim the Word of God. What God has put in our heart from His Word, we proclaim to those around us. What a privilege. What an honor. What a responsibility. So in these moments now of prayer, I invite you to reflect. I invite you to worship. I invite you to sing a song to God. I invite you to open the Word of God. I invite all of us to think about what it is that God wants us to do with our worship and with His Word. Maybe there's somebody here that you want to pray for this morning. Maybe you'd like to come here at the front and kneel and pray as an outward expression of your worship and your prayers. Scott Harris, our missions minister, will be coming in just a few moments to bring God's word to us in sermon. Maybe you'd like to come and pray for him and pray over him. What a privilege we have in these moments to be still and know that he is God and we worship him and we open his word and he speaks to us. Let's pray together. salvation in no one else God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard praise the Lord oh my soul I will praise the Lord all of my life I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Gracious Father, we are so thankful that we can call on your name in this place today. And Father, like Paul and Silas, may we choose to praise you even in the midst of adversity. May we do so, Lord, so that people see and they watch and they listen. And your spirit moves and works. And we have an opportunity then to answer the question that's asked, that was asked of Paul and Silas. When people 
will say, what must I do to be saved? I want what you have. Tell me how I can get that. What a privilege, Father, it is for us to proclaim your word boldly to those whom you have placed in front of us in our paths. So, Lord, we pray this morning that you would speak into our hearts and our lives. You would encourage us. You would strengthen us. But you would challenge us and convict us. Pray for Scott as he comes in a few moments, Lord. May your word be boldly proclaimed. And may your spirit have the freedom to move and work mightily, just as your spirit moved in that jail so many years ago. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's an honor to be with you today. A year ago, yesterday, our senior pastor, Mike Glenn, lost his dad. And I'm so glad that he can be with his family down in Huntsville this weekend. I know that you'll continue to lift he and his family up in prayer. You know, I have the incredible honor every couple of years uh, to teach a missions class at Belmont University. And uh, this year, nine students, they all love the Lord. And we got to, last Monday, go on a field trip. And um, I took them to three of our missions partners in this city. The first stop was to Siloam Health Center in the Melrose area, where I-440 and I-65 meet. Incredible health care facility uh, run by an amazing group of Christian healthcare professionals. Do you know that Nashville ranks number three out of all American cities as a resettlement location for political and other types of refugees that are allowed into this country? And that every refugee that is resettled in Nashville starts their health care journey at Siloam. And the gospel is offered, powerful. We then went up uh, Franklin Road, turns into 8th Avenue, and on the campus of First Baptist Nashville is Christian Women's Job Corps, where women who uh, wish to break the bounds of poverty, they enter into a mentor relationship, GED and computer classes, job skills training, and people are saved in that process. And then we went a little further, we crossed a Korean uh, the Korean Veterans Bridge, and in the shadow of LP Field is a church that Brentwood Baptist started a few years ago called Set Free. Set Free is actually a network of about 60 Southern Baptist churches, and they describe themselves as a church for the homeless and the addicted. And 34 men live at that church. And every pastor in this set-free network around the country, he himself was either homeless or addicted, brought into the ministry, trained, raised up, and is now pastoring a set-free. And Kenny Betzer, the pastor of Nashville set-free, was on the streets of Los Angeles where the Lord met him. And I got to show these students a glimpse of what God is doing in our community. And we have the honor to partner with a lot more. Steve Robinson, uh, head of FCA for Middle Tennessee. A group of people here just this weekend were celebrating his 40 years in ministry. Daryl Murray here today um, with Welcome Home Ministries, uh, a, a place where men recovering from addictions come to get a new start. So you know, your giving matters. It allows us to come to this place and to have lights and, and, and to worship, as Dennis reminded us, with music and the word. But it also goes out far beyond the walls of this church. And it is changing lives in this city and it is changing lives around the world. And so, in gratitude, will you join me during this time of offering, knowing that God will use it and it will change people and it will transform lives. A special welcome to those in Hudson Hall. Uh, the blue buckets are there on the table and on the side of the uh, uh, chair rows. As our ushers come forward, join me in praying that God would multiply what he's given us 
so that we can gather and so that we can go. Let's pray together. Our dear and gracious Father, you have been generous to us and I pray we would be generous to others. Thank you for the ways that you take our resources and you multiply them and you expand them. May we be faithful stewards with the assignments and the opportunities that you give to us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, everyone, joining me on stage is Elizabeth Wiebe. It's kind of a fun last name to say. <laughs> Elizabeth is originally from West Virginia, now lives in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, for years, she worked in the Bush White House in the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. That was the office that has done so much uh, with AIDS in Africa and around the world. Our own partners, Living Hope, have been so blessed with that. But a new job opportunity came for Elizabeth, and now she is part of the team that hosts the Christian Alliance for Orphan Gathering, the summit, every year. And guess what? CAFO is coming, and we are the hosts this year. And there's some information in your bulletin about what's going to be happening here starting on Wednesday, but really getting up and running on Thursday and Friday. And we wanted you to know a little bit about what's going to happen here and the honor and privilege we have of literally hosting the world. So, Elizabeth, welcome. And tell us a little bit about CAFO, what you do, and what's going to be happening here this week. Sure. So, CAFO, Christian Alliance for Orphans, is actually a coalition of 145 organizations and a host uh, network of churches across the country, like this one, that have joined together to say, while we are all doing our own ministries, our own work, what can we do together? What can be accomplished with the church and the Christian orphan care movement equipping and inspiring and serving each other? Um, and this is not new. Throughout history, we can see that when Christians were at their best, they were the ones helping orphans in distress. And today, we are really witnessing believers trying to restore that reputation to say, we are the answer, the church is the answer through Christ to become the true defenders of the fatherless. And I would say that the world is watching and they are noticing this. And so this organization, the first gathering was in 2004, nine years ago with 30 people and it has grown. And so give us a sense of where we are now and what's gonna happen in this building. Yeah, 30 people got together nine years ago to see what this could look like, what they could do together. They weren't even thinking of what we're getting ready to do this week. And through the Lord just stirring hearts in the churches, this has grown, this meeting. Last year we had about 2,000 at Saddleback Church, and this week we will have 2,500 here at Brentwood Baptist Church um, from not only, do you want to give the states? Okay, I don't want to so steal your have, thunder. No, no, no. We got 48 <laughs> states represented. If you know anyone in Vermont or Rhode Island, <laughs> let them know. Come hands. on down. Registration is closed, but we will work them in, okay? We'll work you in. Just don't <laughs> eat lunch. Please. That's right. <laughs> don't eat lunch or breathe. It's standing in the back. And then You're also, and we have 25 countries yeah. represented. So literally people from around the world are coming here. And here are those 25 countries. And it really is every continent. Yeah. Australia, Almost. Bangladesh, Bolivia, Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, Great Britain, Guatemala, Honduras, Haiti, India, Jamaica, Kenya, Korea, Mexico, Peru, the Philippines, Romania, Russia, the Ukraine, Uganda, the USA, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. We want to be good hosts. And I think there's a slide, it might have already been shown, but we can show it again. If you have some time to volunteer, to welcome literally the world, come today at 4 p.m. in Hudson Hall or volunteer online, but try to come today and, and you know, if a ton of people come to volunteer, we may not need everybody, but it's better to have too many than too few. And um, they're coming. And so how do we pray, Elizabeth, sure. for what's going to happen here? Sure. I would mention maybe a spe couple specific ways. Please definitely pray for your great team here. We're just so grateful for this church. It has rallied around almost unlike any other church as much as we've seen any other host church do. And we know that we have maxed out 
the space here in the great team. So please pray for them specifically that they would um, be strong and be healthy and be encouraged through all of this as well. And then please pray specifically for the church, Christ Church itself, as they come. You know, we talk about 2,500 people here, but that just echoes. They each have a congregation back home and a family and a foster child or a potential foster child in the system waiting for the Lord to prick their hearts this week and go back and start that process. Folks waiting around the world to help be partnered with and serve. And so pray for the church and pray that the gospel will be real this week. Though the majority will be believers, it is very important to us. The theme this week is we love because God first loved us. And it is very important that as we are talking about compassion and adoption and foster care and global initiatives, that we tie that specifically to the root, which is the gospel. Why we are changed because of Christ did for us. And what is our natural response to that? And that is what is different between us and other humanitarian efforts um, that we see around the world. So that's important. So please pray for the church. Mm. And then I would ask that you would thirdly just pray for any specific individuals that you know. Pray specifically. And even if you don't know of individual folks coming, you can pray specifically for adoptive moms who are coming and are weary, dads who are just in a new space and they want to step up and lead and they're not quite sure how to do that. This is unfamiliar. Pastors who are coming, I can think of a couple specifics where they haven't done this at their church like you have. It's not part of their top five principles for the year that is driving them forward, but they want it to be, but they feel maxed out and they just need some community and some wisdom on that. You could think of specific advocates, maybe folks you know that have traveled around the world, and when they come back, they've seen such startling need, but it's not just that vast need, it's that one child whose face is now in their, maybe on their phone, and whose name they know, and they're thinking, how do I help that child? What can I do? Businessmen who will be coming, and they're going to meet in a room and talk about what they can do for the fatherless. So lots of specific groups. Please pray specifically for that. Amen. And Elizabeth referenced this. You know, a couple of years ago, as a church, we adopted five objectives. And part of those objectives were 11 goals. And one of those goals is to advocate orphan care. And so we have been resourced. We have felt led that God has something for us to do in this issue of orphan care. And this, this conference that we're hosting is, is part of that. And we have people here in our church that are involved in some huge and important ways. Uh, on the back of your uh, insert is the story of Scott, Ashley, Grant, and Will Fowler. They're members at Station Hill. Scott and Ashley and Grant will not be at CAFO because on Tuesday they leave for China to pick up their son. Now I hope that's always Brentwood Baptist, that because we're large we can do big things even when we're not really big enough to host 2,500 people and 140 breakout sessions and feeding all those folks, pray for good weather. You know, God is responsible for the weather. I, I realize that, but boy, it would help us if it were nice because then we can spill outside, right? Um, but folks like the Fowlers, pray for the hundreds of our members who are trying to wrestle with this question. Pray for organizations like Hope House International. D Deneen Turner is a member of our church. I see her there. Do you know this ministry that provides housing for Ukrainian Christian families to adopt orphans? And in 20 years, over 300 orphans have been taken out of state-run institutions and have been placed into Christian homes. Bid and say yeah. that's a big thing that we have seen mm -hmm. in the movement too. But Hope House is doing is that it's the U.S. church is rising up, the global church is yeah. rising up. You know, we try to support and help them, but Ukraine and uh, there's so many churches there that are saying, What can we do for our own communities? and that'll be a big theme this week. Amen. So it's exciting. So, will you join me in praying blessings as literally the world comes to our house this week? Let's pray, Father. I thank you for this opportunity, for this responsibility. I pray for Elizabeth and for her team. I pray that things here would run so smoothly that these thousands from around the world would not even notice that things are tight. That conversations would take place that would literally change the destinies and the eternities of children who will grow up to be leaders and pastors and, and mothers and fathers in their communities and would break the cycle of abandonment and neglect, and that your church would be strengthened, for this is rooted in the gospel. We pray all of this in your good and mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
adoption grants uh, for our members who are considering this. So we're trying to holistically walk alongside and take care of families who are called to this incredible work. Amen. Well, you know, I shared with you that uh, this is the year anniversary of Mike's father's passing. Well, a couple of months ago, um, we had a loss in my family. My father-in-law had his homegoing graduation. 87 years old, a missionary in Taiwan, 37 years, excellent Chinese skills, lived a great and wonderful and full life. So the day before the funeral was visitation, all right? And so my children are there, ages nine and six, first time that they've ever been to a funeral. And so I'm kind of prepping them for things. And I, and I tell my children, hey, kids, listen, you guys always do great, but you're going to meet a lot of people. They're going to want to shake your hand. Look them in the eye, say hello. This was in Mississippi. Make sure you say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, and all of that, you know. And so they did great. And when the visitation was over, I was complimenting them and encouraging them. And I said, kids, thank you so much for being so kind to all these people who came to be kind to us. And my daughter said, oh, daddy, that's okay. I like meeting strange people. Well, you know, I think she has a career in the ministry because in the ministry... You meet a lot of strange people. No, I'm teasing. But after visitation, my mother-in-law, Frances Rayleigh, 86 years old, I don't know if you've ever been on the receiving end of pastoral care. You know, you may give a lot of care and love, but when you're in need and you are on the receiving end, it's a very powerful uh, experience. And so my mother-in-law said after visitation, she said, you know, she said, Scott, all this love. She said, I don't understand it. I don't deserve it. But I sure will take it. Now that is a picture of grace. That is a picture of salvation. And that is what we see in this story of the Philippian jailer. We've heard it once. We need to read it again. Would you please stand, and we're going to read from Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. And when we're seated, keep your Bible open, because we're going to be referring to these verses. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, don't harm yourself because all of us are here. Then the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he escorted them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the message of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had believed God with his entire household. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, we are here, we are yours. Indeed, the word of God has spoken. Implant it deep within us so we can pass it on to others. In your name I pray, amen. Well, you may be seated. So here we are. This is the second of Paul's three missionary journeys. The, third, uh, the, the first would have been about five years before. Acts 16 is a significant chapter because it is in Acts 16, prior to this story, that we are introduced to Timothy, 
the first appearance that he makes. And then in verses 6 through 10, we read about the Macedonian call. I don't know if you grew up in church, if you were familiar with that phrase, but Paul and his band are in modern-day Turkey going from town to town. But the Spirit of Jesus, it says in verse 6, prevents them from going to Bithynia, and so the answer is no. So Paul pauses, and he then receives the vision, the man from Macedonia, that says, come over and help us. Now, many reasons why this is significant. Macedonia is in northern Greece. Macedonia is in Europe. In the biblical record, the gospel had not yet gotten to Europe. It had been focused in Asia. And so Paul, in his obedience, whether he understood the significance of this at the time or not, goes to the city of Philippi, where we pick up the story, and starts the first church on the European continent. It changed Western civilization. And so, Acts 16 is special. And so, Paul goes, and do you notice here with the Macedonian call? The call was not only go, but before the instructions came, he was told no. How does God speak in your life? Do you only get the sense that God says no? Or do you understand that God says no to prepare us for a greater yes? In your relationship with the Lord, do you not only accept the yes assignments, do you embrace the no assignments? You see, God knew that he could trust Paul with the no. And so, he could then entrust Paul with the yes. And in Acts chapter 16, we see stories of liberation. We see the story of Lydia. Paul comes to this city. Philippi was a Roman colony. Paul typically, in chapters before this, would go into a city, and he would go first to the synagogue. Do you notice here, Paul does not go to the synagogue because chances are, There was not a synagogue in this city. So instead, he finds a group of women at the water's edge. The first record we have of the gospel going to Europe, the first Europeans that heard the gospel was a group of women. And we see Lydia that believes and invites Paul and his team to his home. We then later in the chapter, we see that this demon-possessed slave girl who is economically used for someone else's purposes, we see that she is freed. And her owners are not too happy with this. And they bring Paul and Silas before the people and they are beaten and they are thrown into jail. And now we pick up this story of the Philippian jail of the Philippian jailer. And do you notice here that in Lydia's case, the Spirit of God came to her gently, but to the jailer, it comes like a lion. And all of us have different experiences in how Jesus comes to us. Sometimes it's a still, small whisper, and sometimes it is a roaring lion. We have recorded three times in Scripture where Paul mentions that he was beaten three times, but this is the only one where we have some details. So they've been beaten, they've been thrown in jail, and what are they doing around midnight? It says that they are praying and singing and praising. Now, if I were Silas in that jail with Paul, Paul would be on his own singing a solo. You know, for most of us, praising comes, am I right or wrong here, Praising comes after deliverance. Thank you, God, for rescuing me. And he honors that, and we should. But do you notice here that Paul and Silas are praying prior to deliverance coming? They are so spirit-filled, they are so spirit-controlled, they are rejoicing in what had already happened since they arrived at Philippi. Lydia and a group of women accept Jesus a young girl who is oppressed and used for ill gain by other people is freed from her demonic oppression. 
They are singing and they are praising God. They are probably awake at midnight because their wounds were such that they probably were in such pain they could not sleep. How do you recognize the earthquakes that God sends into your life? Are they disasters or are they agents of deliverance? Do you think that God might have sent this earthquake because he knew that he could trust Paul and Silas? Do you think God knew that he wanted to bring salvation to this jailer and his household? And how, how else to get the gospel into a jailer's house than to put the gospel in the jail? And Paul and Silas were willing to be used. Their prayer, I doubt, was rescue me. Instead, their prayer was use me. And we have permission as God's children to entreat and to pray for deliverance. And we can and we must. But do we also know how to pray the prayer, use me wherever I am? And so the story continues. The prisoners are freed, but they don't go anywhere. Why don't they go anywhere? Was it just the shock of the earthquake? Or was there something in Paul and Silas as they were listening to Paul and Silas praise and pray that they said, we're not going to let physical freedom get in the way of our potential spiritual liberation, and we're going to stay right here, and we want to get to the bottom of this, and we want what those people have. And the jailer comes. He's about to kill himself. And do you see this beautiful picture between Paul and this jailer? Who knows how the jailer had treated Paul and Silas just hours before, right? But now, Paul, in his concern for others, though wounded and unjustly accused, he says to the jailer what? Hey, don't harm yourself. We're here. We're not going anywhere. Do you see how Paul and believers are others-centered even when their own lives are so full? And the jailer then asks the question. And really, the question has not changed since the dawn of time. It certainly has not changed in this 2,000 years. Do you know the world continues to ask this question, what must we do to be saved? Now, they may not phrase it that way. But when we leave this place into this world that God created, that yet is fallen and broken and groaning for redemption, the sin that you see and the bondage and the captivity and the blindness, it is because people are trying to answer this question. But they're looking in the wrong place for the answer. Amen. And Paul and Silas had joy in their life not only because they themselves were the recipients of this grace that they did not understand, that they did not deserve, but they were going to take it. And when you take it, you can then share it. And that's what Paul and Silas did. They were ready for an answer. They did not wait for the jailer to apologize for putting their feet too tightly in the stocks. They did not need to first go over their list of grievances and their list of needs. They were ready for an answer. Believe. And they spoke the message to both the jailer and his household. And they, along with Lydia, and who knows, possibly the girl who had been freed from the evil spirit early in chapter 16, I think they became the core for the first church on the European continent. Because you see this question, what must I do to be saved, is the question. And at some point in your life, if you know Jesus today, you asked that question in your way. And someone was a Paul and Silas to you and explained to you what it meant to follow God. Persecution, unjust accusations, Unfair imprisonment resulted in this church starting. 
And we see this as a theme throughout Acts. In Acts chapter 4, the church is persecuted, and what happens? They multiply. Again, in chapter 5, the church is persecuted, and what happens? It multiplies. In chapter 8 of Acts, the church is persecuted, and guess what happens? It multiplies. Have you heard this? Prosperity has done more to hurt the church than persecution ever has. And we see this incredible transformation. Do you know that persecution still happens today? Simple assignment. Go home today and just type in persecution.com. Persecution.com. It is the website of the Voice of the Martyrs that is this incredible ministry that accounts and records and rallies the church for prayer for people around the world that are persecuted for their faith. Because we are told in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So we see in Acts chapter 16 that the Philippian church gets started. And we see two key missional strategies at work. Among our mission staff, we talk about oikos and we talk about ethnos. Ethnos, the peoples of the world. What do Paul and Silas do? They travel, they cross geographic and cultural barriers to bring the gospel to people who have never heard. These people in Philippi, they had never heard. But then once the gospel gets into a place, how does the gospel spread? It spreads through one's oikos. It spreads through one's circle of influence. Oikos means household, the people that you know. It's one person telling someone else, this is what happened to me. And so we see this incredible church planting strategy taking place. Is this the story about a jailer? Absolutely. Is it a story earlier in the chapter about Lydia and the demon-possessed girl? Yes, it is. But it is also about a church getting started. And I wonder whatever happened to this church. You know, we have some glimpses. Paul years later, wrote to these people. You have the letter in your Bible. It is the letter to the Philippians. And so I wonder when the letter came, if Lydia was there reading it with others. I wonder if the jailer and his family were there reading. And so when you read Philippians, always keep in mind Acts chapter 16. There's one verse in Philippians And boy, I think it's significant given what happens in Acts chapter 16. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. This is what Paul says. Paul says, My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Harken back to Acts 16. Did we not see evidence of God's power in that story? The earthquake, yes. But the saving power of Jesus, did we not see Paul willingly enter in into suffering in the way that Jesus suffered for us so that others might be saved? I bet when Lydia and the jailer and his family years later read these verses from Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, I bet they remembered that night. Here are some questions for us. Do you today acknowledge your spiritual liberation? Does it matter to you? Maybe you recall the date and the time. Maybe it was more gradual. You can't put your finger on exactly what. But does it define your life and the trajectory of your life? Another question. Have you ever personally experienced the joy of answering that question for someone else? Has anyone come to you based on the fruit of your life and said, tell me, what must I do to be saved? Have you ever had that privilege? If you haven't, do you have the courage to pray for that opportunity? Why would you not 
be thrilled to bear witness for what Christ has done for you. Have you ever had the joy of leading someone to saving faith like Paul and Silas did in that jail? Are you willing to pray for that opportunity? Do you recognize that life's trials, the earthquakes that come to you, are indeed actually spiritual food for your faith to feed on? Does your praise only come after deliverance? Or have you been able to experience the incredible intimacy with your Lord and Savior when you're able to praise while imprisoned, realizing that God is orchestrating things for your good and for his glory? An assignment for you Another assignment for you. Here's a card. It's simple. It's called an Oikos card. Praying for the people in your world. We have copies right outside in the Mission Center. Would you take one of these? And would you simply today, this week, write down the people that are in your life that are far from God and pray for them? Pray for opportunity. I, maybe God will not have to put you literally in prison to have the opportunity to answer the question, but watch and see when you pray earnestly that opportunity comes. And do you have the courage and are you convinced that you can say to someone, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved? If you've never done that, could that be an aspiration for you as a follower of Jesus? The prisoners were liberated. Paul and Silas, though, were never really imprisoned to begin with. They were free. Amen. They were free to praise. They were free to love. And do you see this jailer? His life was transformed. He washed wounds as his own wounds were washed. His life was transformed, and we see fruit in this story. He washed his new brothers in Christ. He gave them something to eat. He welcomed them into his home. And the Philippian church grew and prospered. It's a story that we are part of today. So what's your decision? To come and be a member of this body? Maybe you're asking the question, what must I do to be saved? Maybe you're a believer and you want the courage of Paul and Silas. Do you not think that God doesn't want to give it to you? Would you pray with me? Our dear and gracious Father, thank you for the gospel that has set us free. Empower us to free others, for they are worth it. For you died for them as you died for us. We give you our hearts, we give you our minds. We pray for people around the world in persecution. We pray for orphans today, that they would be embraced by this loving God that brings salvation. Pray the decisions would be made here that will change the course of someone's eternity. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing? Sing again. You're a lamp unto my feet. Your word.
invite you, come join us in the parlor. Grab an Oikos card. Pray for KFO. Live saved, live sent, live free. And I close with this prayer from the ancient church to us today. Oh God, since we know not what today may bring forth, but only that the hour for serving you is always present, May we wake to the instant claims of your holy will, not waiting for tomorrow, but yielding today. Consecrate with your presence the way our feet must go, and our humblest work will shine, and the roughest places be made plain. Amen. God bless you. We are dismissed.